Welcome to Brightly Storytime. I'm Miss Linda, and today we're going to read Miss Maple Seeds Story and Pictures by Eliza Wheeler. On a bright August morning, Miss Maple flies home. She has hurried ahead of the flock to get ready for her guests. Miss Maple has traveled all summer long, searching the land for orphan seeds that got lost during the spring planting. She hopes to help them grow strong here in her tall maple tree and get ready for next year's planting. She learns each seed by heart, all similar, yet none the same. Take care, my little ones, Miss Maple says. For the world is big, and you are small. Miss Maple takes them on field trips to learn about being a seed. Some will be carried by the river and land in soft, muddy soils. Friends of the river will help them bloom in safe places. They tour the grassy fields and thick forests. Many seeds will be blown here, where rich soil will keep their pods healthy, and the sun and rain will help them grow tall. In bustling gardens, seeds must take care to stay clear of weedy characters. Snuggled in each night, Miss Maple reads flower tales by firefly light. Before going to bed, she whispers, Take care, my little ones, for the world is big and you are small. Winter comes with the snow, a time to stay cozy and dry. Neighborhood friends gather to share their supplies of hot maple syrup, old corn husks, and juicy fruit rinds. Together, they pass the long months with stories and songs. When spring comes, thunderstorms pour curtains of rain. Don't be afraid. Raindrops help us grow, Miss Maple says to the seeds. They learn to dance and burrow down into the muddy ground. On a windy May morning, the last spring petals drift down from the sky. The time has come for Miss Maple to send her seeds off to find roots of their own. They set out on an exciting new journey into the wide unknown. Some seeds will take root in nearby gardens, while others will travel on distant winds and far away tides. Miss Maple has given them guidance and love, and now her part in their story has come to an end. They say their goodbyes with sweet memories past and bright futures ahead. As Miss Maple gazes out across the land below, she whispers, Take care, my little ones, for the world is big and you are small. But never forget, even the grandest of trees once had to grow up from the smallest of seeds. Into the evening, she sips her green tea in the quiet hollow of the old maple tree. But the end of each season is a start to the next. One summer morning, Miss Maple grabs her willow-weed hat, whistles a merry tune, and sets off to follow the faraway call of other lost seeds waiting to be found. I 
like knowing that Miss Maple is out there taking care of all those seeds on their journey. Welcome to Brightly Storytime. I'm Miss Linda. At readbrightly.com, you can sign up to get reading tips, book recommendations, and videos like these delivered to your email inbox. Today, we're going to read about a little caterpillar with a big appetite. It's called The Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle. In the light of the moon, a little egg lay on a leaf. One Sunday morning, the warm sun came up and pop, out of the egg came a tiny and very hungry caterpillar. He started to look for some food. On Monday, he ate through one apple, but he was still hungry. On Tuesday, he ate through two pears, but he was still hungry. On Wednesday, he ate through three plums but he was still hungry. On Thursday, he ate through four strawberries, but he was still hungry. On Friday, he ate through five oranges, but he was still hungry. On Saturday, he ate through one piece of chocolate cake, one ice cream cone, one pickle, one slice of Swiss cheese, one slice of salami, one lollipop, one piece of cherry pie, one sausage, one cupcake, and one slice of watermelon. That night, he had a stomach ache. The next day was Sunday again. The caterpillar ate through one nice green leaf, and after that, he felt much better. Now he wasn't hungry anymore, and he wasn't a little caterpillar anymore. He was a big, fat caterpillar. He built a small house, called a cocoon, around himself. He stayed inside for more than two weeks. Then he nibbled a hole in the cocoon, pushed his way out, and... He was a beautiful butterfly. I thought the caterpillar would never be full. Eating the right things helped him grow into a beautiful butterfly, and the wrong things gave him a stomach ache. You too can grow up big and strong if you eat right. Señorita Mariposa, tú eres muy hermosa. Señorita Mariposa, tú eres muy hermosa, te quiero a ti. Hola amigos, welcome to Brightly Storytime. I'm Mr. G, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. Today's storytime is extra special, because after I read you my book, I'm going to sing you the rest of the song that inspired it. They are both called Señorita Mariposa, which means Miss Butterfly. Are you ready? Great, let's begin. Today's book is Señorita Mariposa by Ben Gundersheimer. That's me, Mr. G. Little butterfly, you just caught my eye. Little butterfly flying through the sky. Pequeña mariposa, llamaste mi atención. Pequeña mariposa, volando por el cielo. I love to see you in the trees, playing with the bumblebees. Your pretty orange wings make me want to sing. Me encanta verte entre los árboles. Jugando con los abejorros, tus bellas alas anaranjadas me inspiran a cantar. Señorita Mariposa, tú eres muy hermosa. 
Señorita Mariposa, tú eres muy poderosa. Te quiero a ti. Little Butterfly, you're so beautiful. Little Butterfly, you're so powerful. I love you. It's hard to say goodbye, but I know you have to fly. Es difícil decir adiós, pero sé que tienes que partir. 60 miles or more a day, por más de 60 millas al día. We will see you on your way. Te veremos en tu camino. Can't believe how far you go on your way to Mexico. No puedo creer lo lejos que vas en tu camino a México. Over mountains capped with snow. Sobre montañas cubiertas de nieve. To the deserts down below. A los desiertos abajo. Then one day a great surprise. There's a flash across the sky. Beating wings warmed by the sun. Can't believe how far you've come. Algún día una gran sorpresa. Hay un destello en el cielo. Las alas calentadas por el sol. No puedo creer cuánto has viajado. Tú eres muy valiente. Tú eres tan fuerte. Tu viaje es un milagro. Te admiro mucho. You're so brave. You're so strong. Your journey is a miracle. I admire you so much. What a bright and brilliant sight. Monarchs fill me with delight. How nice to have a million friends. The butterfly fiesta never ends. Qué espectáculo tan brillante y colorido. Las monarcas me llenan de gozo. Qué bonito tener un millón de compañeros. La fiesta de la mariposa nunca termina. Señorita mariposa, tú eres muy hermosa. Señorita Mariposa, tú eres muy poderosa. Te quiero a ti. Little Butterfly, you're so beautiful. Little Butterfly, you're so powerful. I love you. I hope you all enjoyed learning about monarch butterflies and the extraordinary journey they take each year. To learn more about how to help the butterflies, check out the note in the back of my book. Now, are you ready for the song, Señorita Mariposa? Do you think you could help me sing it? Let's do it. Señorita Mariposa, tú eres muy hermosa. Señorita Mariposa, tú eres muy hermosa. Te quiero a ti. Little butterfly, you just caught my eye. Little butterfly, flying through the sky, I'm so happy. Tus alas preciosas Cuando te posa en la rosa Your pretty yellow wings They make me wanna sing Señorita mariposa Tú eres muy hermosa Señorita mariposa Tú eres muy hermosa Te quiero a ti I can't believe how far you go All the way to Mexico Sixty miles or more a day We will see you on your way Señorita Mariposa Tú eres muy hermosa Señorita Mariposa Tú eres muy hermosa Te quiero a ti Little butterfly flying through the sky I'm so happy you're alive Welcome to Brightly Storytime. I'm Miss Linda. At readbrightly.com, you can sign up to get reading tips, book recommendations, and videos like these delivered to your email inbox. Today, we're going to read a story about a clever girl who helps her friend. It's called Kate Who Tamed the Wind by Liz Garton Scanlon and Lee White. Once there was a man living all alone in a creaky house on the tip top of a steep hill. 
The man lived all alone in the creaky house on the tip top of a steep hill where a soft wind blew. The man lived all alone in the creaky house where the curtains swung and chimes spun as a soft wind blew. And blew. And blew. The wind blew until the shutters banged in the creaky house on the tip top of the steep hill. The wind blew, the shutters banged, and the boards bent. The wind blew, the shutters banged, the boards bent, the table tipped, and the tea spilled. The tea spilled, and the bread broke on the tippy table in the creaky house at the tip top of the steep hill. And still the wind blew. The wind blew and off the birds flew. The birds flew and the dust did too. And the man cried, what to do? What to do? The wind whipped his words from the tip top of the steep hill to the itty bitty town at the bottom where a little girl called Kate heard the cry and felt it too. She wondered what on earth to do. Kate could not stop the wind she knew, but She could wheel a load of new trees to the tip top of the dusty hill in her wagon. There, Kate dug deep holes and watered muddy mounds till the trees grew. As the trees grew, the wind blew. The trees grew, the wind blew, and the time flew. The time flew as the trees grew and grew. And Kate did too. The trees grew till the leaves fluttered and the shutters stilled and the boards bounced back. The leaves fluttered, the shutters stilled, the boards bounced back and the dust died down. The dust died down, the tea steeped, and the birds peeped. The birds peeped and the old man poured sweet tea and said, for you, near the quiet house on the tip top of the green hill, where a bright breeze blew. Changing things for the better like Kate did can take time, but it always pays off in the end. Can you think of ways to improve your own home? Maybe you could plant a tree or start a garden. Hi everyone. Today's flip along is Make Way for Ducklings by Robert McCloskey. Mr. and Mrs. Mallard were looking for a place to live, but every time Mr. Mallard saw what looked like a nice place, Mrs. Mallard said it was no good. There were sure to be foxes in the woods or turtles in the water, and she was not going to raise a family where there might be foxes or turtles. So they flew on and on. When they got to Boston, they felt too tired to fly any further. There was a nice pond in the public garden with a little island on it. The very place to spend the night, quacked Mr. Mallard. So down they flapped. Next morning they fished for their breakfast in the mud at the bottom of the pond, but they didn't find much. 
Just as they were getting ready to start on their way, a strange, enormous bird came by. It was pushing a boat full of people, and there was a man sitting on its back. Good morning, quacked Mr. Mallard, being polite. The big bird was too proud to answer. But the people on the boat threw peanuts into the water, so the Mallards followed them all round the pond and got another breakfast, better than the first. I like this place, said Mrs. Mallard as they climbed out on the bank and waddled along. Why don't we build a nest and raise our ducklings right in this pond? There are no foxes and no turtles, and the people feed us peanuts. What could be better? Good, said Mr. Mallard, delighted that at last Mrs. Mallard had found a place that suited her. But... Look out, squawked Mrs. Mallard all of a dither. You'll get run over. And when she got her breath, she added, This is no place for babies, with all those horrid things rushing about. We'll have to look somewhere else. So they flew over Beacon Hill and round the State House, but there was no place there. They looked in Lewisburg Square, but there was no water to swim in. Then they flew over the Charles River. This is better, quacked Mr. Mallard. That island looks like a nice, quiet place, and it's only a little way from the public garden. Yes, said Mrs. Mallard, remembering the peanuts. That looks like just the right place to hatch ducklings. So they chose a cozy spot among the bushes near the water and settled down to build their nest. And only just in time, for now they were beginning to molt. All their old wing feathers started to drop out, and they would not be able to fly again until the new ones grew in. But of course they could swim, and one day they swam over to the park on the riverbank, and there they met a policeman called Michael. Michael fed them peanuts, and after that the Mallards called on Michael every day. After Mrs. Mallard had laid eight eggs in the nest, she couldn't go to visit Michael any more, because she had to sit on the eggs to keep them warm. She moved off the nest only to get a drink of water, or to have her lunch, or to count the eggs and make sure they were all there. One day the ducklings hatched out. First came Jack, then Cack, and then Lack, then Mac and Knack and Whack and Pack and Quack. Mr. and Mrs. Mallard were bursting with pride. It was a great responsibility taking care of so many ducklings, and it kept them very busy. One day, Mr. Mallard decided he'd like to take a trip to see what the rest of the river was like further on. So off he set. I'll meet you in a week in the public garden, he quacked over his shoulder. Take good care of the ducklings. Don't you worry, said Mrs. Mallard. I know all about bringing up children. And she did. She taught them how to swim and dive. She taught them to walk in a line, to come when they were called, and to keep a safe distance from bikes and scooters and other things with wheels. When at last she felt perfectly satisfied with them, she said one morning, Come along, children, follow me. Before you could wink an eyelash, Jack, Cack, Lack, Mac, Knack, Whack, Pack, and Quack fell into line just as they had been taught. Mrs. Mallard led the way into the water, and they swam behind her to the opposite bank. There they waded ashore and waddled along till they came to the highway. Mrs. Mallard stepped out to cross the road. Honk, honk, 
went the horns on the speeding cars. Quack! went Mrs. Mallard as she tumbled back again. Quack, 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 quack! went Jack, Cack, Lack, Mac, Knack, Whack, Pack, and Quack, just as loud as their little quackers could quack. The cars kept speeding by and honking, and Mrs. Mallard and the ducklings kept right on quack, quack, quacking. They made such a noise that Michael came running, waving his arms and blowing his whistle. He planted himself in the center of the road, raised one hand to stop the traffic, and then beckoned with the other, the way policemen do, for Mrs. Mallard to cross over. As soon as Mrs. Mallard and the ducklings were safe on the other side and on their way down Mount Vernon Street, Michael rushed back to his police booth. He called Clancy at headquarters and said, There's a family of ducks walking down the street. Clancy said, Family of what? Ducks, yelled Michael. Send a police car quick. Meanwhile, Mrs. Mallard had reached the corner bookshop and turned into Charles Street with Jack, Cack, Lack, Mac, Knack, Whack, Pack, and Quack all marching in a line behind her. Everyone stared. An old lady from Beacon Hill said, Isn't it amazing? And the man who swept the street said, Well, now ain't that nice. And when Mrs. Mallard heard them, she was so proud, she tipped her nose in the air and walked along with an extra swing in her waddle. When they came to the corner of Beacon Street, there was the police car with four policemen that Clancy had sent from headquarters. The policemen held back the traffic so Mrs. Mallard and the ducklings could march across the street. right on into the public garden. Inside the gate, they all turned round to say thank you to the policeman. The policeman smiled and waved goodbye. When they reached the pond and swam across to the little island, there was Mr. Mallard waiting for them, just as he had promised. The ducklings liked the new island so much that they decided to live there. All day long they follow the swan boats and eat peanuts. And when night falls, they swim to their little island and go to sleep. Hi everyone, today's flip along is Francis Hodgson Burnett's The Secret Garden. Retold by Francis Gilbert. Illustrated by Bridget Barriger. When a little orphan named Mary Lennox was sent far away to live with her uncle, she was the sourest girl anyone had ever known. She was frail and scrawny with pale skin and an angry face. She was not kind to anyone. After Mary's ship docked in England, she was met by Mrs. Medlock, her uncle's housekeeper. They traveled by train and horse-drawn carriage through the dark, rainy night. At the end of the long journey, Mary stood before a huge oak door. She had arrived at Misselthwaite Manor, her new home. Mrs. Medlock led Mary upstairs. Here you are, she said. You must stay in this room, no wandering about the house. Martha, your maid, will come to look after you. And then Mrs. Medlock left. Mary was all alone. The next morning, Mary was woken by Martha. Out the window was a huge stretch of land with not a tree in sight. It looked like a purple sea. What is out there? she asked. Me! 
many things, said Martha. Flowers, birds, foxes, honeybees. My brother Dickon knows every animal and plant around. And there is a garden no one ever enters. Mary's eyes widened. Why? she asked. Your uncle locked it up, Martha replied. He buried the key when his wife died ten years ago. No one has been in there since. Mary wanted to find the secret garden. She set out in the morning air along the winding paths, past fountains and ponds. She felt as if there was no one left in the world but her. Day after day, Mary walked the grounds, searching for the garden. A robin often greeted her with his merry chirp. It was as if he could talk. Little by little, the fresh air and walking brought pink to Mary's cheeks. She came home each night hungry for dinner. Why, you're not such a sickly little thing anymore, said Mrs. Medlock one evening. One crisp morning, Mary saw the robin digging up some earth near an ivy-covered stone wall. Good morning, sir, she said. Are you looking for a worm? The robin stopped digging, popped his head up, and turned toward her. And that was when Mary discovered something lying there in the soil. A key, cried Mary. Is it the key to the secret garden? Mary ran to the wall and parted the thick ivy. Suddenly, as if by magic, a gust of wind caught some loose vines and swung them aside. There was a door in the wall with a rusty keyhole. Mary took a deep breath. She fitted the key in the door and pushed. Slowly, slowly, on creaky iron hinges, the door swung open. Mary slipped through the door and closed it behind her. She was inside the secret garden. It was the sweetest, most mysterious place anyone could imagine. Vines climbed the walls and hung down like curtains. Small green shoots poked out of the earth. Mary felt as if she had found a world all her own. She picked up a stick and began to clear away the weeds. She worked in the garden all day. The next day on the way to the garden, Mary met a boy. He was sitting next to a fox and a rabbit, who seemed to be his friends. You must be Mary, he said. I'm Dickon, Martha's brother. Where are you going? Dickon looked like a boy who could keep a secret. I found a secret garden, said Mary. She led Dickon to the hidden door and pushed it open. It's like a dream, said Dickon. I'll come back every day, and we'll make this garden as pretty as ever. The two new friends worked all afternoon, clearing places to plant seeds. At dinner time, Mary raced to the house to tell Martha she had met her brother. Martha was waiting for Mary. Your uncle would like to see you, she said. Mary was led to her uncle's study, where she met him for the first time, he sat frowning behind a large wooden desk. I am going away till the end of summer, he said. Are they looking after you? Is there anything you need? Mary thought quickly. I would like a patch of earth, sir, and some seeds to plant. Is that all? he said. Very well. Take all the earth you want, child, and make it come alive. That night, in her quiet room, Mary heard a child's cry. Where was it coming from? She tiptoed down a long, dark hallway. The crying became louder, until at last it led her to a closed door. Pushing it open, she saw a very large bed and a pale, thin boy in it, crying. When he saw Mary, his eyes grew wide. Are you a ghost? asked the boy. No, whispered Mary. Are you? No, replied the boy. I'm Colin. 
as Mary and Colin talked, they discovered that they were cousins. Mary's uncle was Colin's father. Why are you shut up here? Mary asked. I am very sick, said Colin. Father and my doctor say I must stay in bed. Mary didn't think he looked sick. He looked like she did when she'd first arrived. Maybe he just needed some fresh air, she thought. She told him about the secret garden. Oh, I should love to see it, cried Colin. Then I will take you there, Mary replied. My friend Dickon will help. The next day Dickon arrived at Colin's door, a lamb in his arms and a little fox beside him. He had one squirrel on his shoulder and another in his pocket. Colin was astonished. The children put Colin in his wheelchair and snuck him out of the manor, down the path, and into the secret garden. The garden had never been so beautiful. Overnight, the cherry blossoms had bloomed, and everything was a blaze of pink. Oh, may I help you tend the garden? pleaded Colin. Of course you may, said Mary. And so in the summer months that followed, the friends worked in the secret garden from morning till night. Mary had been right. Colin was not sick. He merely needed to run and play and breathe the crisp, fresh air. He got stronger each day and no longer needed his wheelchair. And when, at summer's end, Colin's father returned to the manor, he could not believe the sight of the healthy boy who ran into his arms. Who? What? he cried. What has happened to make you so well? The secret garden, said Colin. Take me there, said his father, wiping his tears. Let me see it again. So Colin led his father down the path to meet Mary and Dickon and to see the secret garden where magic grows. Hi, everyone. Today's flip along is Thumbelina. Story by Hans Christian Andersen. Adapted and illustrated by Brad Sneed. Once there was a woman who wanted very much to have a child, but as the years passed, her wish was never granted. At last she went to visit an old witch to ask for her help. Patiently the witch listened, and then replied, Take this seed and plant it in a flower pot, but beware, for strong magic will never do exactly as you desire. The woman thanked the witch and hurried home. She planted the seed and watered it carefully. Immediately a lovely flower sprang up, though its petals stayed tightly closed. The woman was terribly disappointed, but said, It is a beautiful flower, and she kissed the petals. As soon as she did, the flower opened to reveal a very tiny girl sitting inside. In fact, the child was scarcely as tall as the woman's thumb and so she named her Thumbelina. Thumbelina was so little, she was able to use a walnut shell for a bed and flower petals for a mattress. During the day, she played on a table where the woman placed a dish full of water. A large tulip petal became her boat, and the tiny girl rowed from side to side with two oars made of horsehair. While she rode, Thumbelina sang more sweetly than anything that had ever before been heard. One night, a big toad crept through an open window and leaped onto the table where Thumbelina was sleeping. What a pretty wife she would make for my son, said the toad, and she took up the walnut shell and jumped through the window into the garden. The toad lived with her son on the muddy bank of a nearby stream. When he saw Thumbelina, the sun began to croak excitedly. Hush, or you'll wake her, said the mother toad. Then she might run away. Now, help me put her on one of the lily pads. She's so very small, it will seem like an island to her, and she'll never be able to escape. Quickly, 
and then we must prepare your new home under the marsh. Early the next morning, Thumbelina woke and was startled to find herself on a lily pad in the middle of a stream. She could see nothing but water on every side of the large green leaf and no way of reaching land. She began to cry for help until at last the mother toad swam out to the lily pad with her son. The old toad said, Hush, child, I want you to meet my son. He is to be your husband, and you will live happily together under the marsh. Croak, 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 was all her son could say for himself. Then the toad stole Thumbelina's walnut shell bed and swam away, for they were still not finished with their preparations. As soon as they were out of sight, Thumbelina began to cry louder for help. Fortunately, the fish who swam in the water had heard everything. It made them sorry to think that the poor girl must go and live with the horrible toads. They nibbled away at the lily stalk until Thumbelina's leaf was set free and started to drift downstream. Thumbelina sailed past many towns and was happy, for now the toads could not possibly catch her and she enjoyed feeling the warm sunshine on her face. A butterfly fluttered around her and at last lighted on her lily pad. Thumbelina gave one end of her sash to the butterfly and fastened the other end to the lily pad, which now glided faster than ever. As they neared a bend in the stream, suddenly a large beetle flew by. Whoosh! The moment he caught sight of Thumbelina, he grabbed her and flew to a tree. Thumbelina cried out and begged him to let her go, but the beetle seated himself by her side, gave her some honey to eat, and told her she was very pretty, though not in the least like an insect. Meanwhile, all the beetles who lived in the tree stared curiously at Thumbelina and turned up their feelers at her. One said, she has only two legs. How ugly that looks. She has no feelers, said another. She looks just like a human being. Oh, she is ugly, they all exclaimed. The beetle who had captured Thumbelina listened to the others, growing more dejected with each insult. Finally, he decided he would have no more to do with her. He flew Thumbelina down from the tree and dropped her on a daisy. Surprised but unharmed, Thumbelina began to laugh, happy to be free again. That summer, Thumbelina lived all alone in the forest. She wove herself a bed of grass and hung it under a wide leaf to protect herself from the rain. She ate honey from the flowers and drank the dew from their leaves every morning. But as autumn days turned to winter, all the birds who had sung to her flew away. The leaves on the trees turned brown. Soon it began to snow, and the snowflakes, as they fell upon her, were like a whole shovelful falling upon one of us, for we are tall while she was only two inches high. Near the woods lay a large cornfield, but only the dry stubble remained. Still, for Thumbelina, it was like struggling through a large wood. Oh, how she shivered with the cold! She came at last to the door of a field mouse, who lived in a snug underground den. Thumbelina knocked timidly to beg for a morsel of food. You poor little creature, said the field mouse. Come into my warm den and have something to eat. The mouse was so pleased to have company that she said, You're welcome to stay with me all winter if you like but you must keep my rooms clean and neat and sing songs for me, for I love to hear music. Thumbelina did everything the field mouse asked and began to feel very comfortable in her new home. We'll have a visitor soon, said the field mouse one day. My neighbor the mole is stopping by. He is even better off than I am. If you could only have him for a husband, you would be well provided for indeed. But when the mole came to visit, Thumbelina discovered that she did not care for him at all. He preferred being underground, did not like the sun or the blue sky, 
or even the flowers, and seemed very grumpy. After supper, the mole invited Thumbelina and the field mouse to take an evening stroll, using the long passage he had dug to his own dwelling. Halfway along, they came across a dead swallow. The mole pushed it aside and said, How dreadful to be a bird! It can't even survive the winter. The field mouse loudly agreed, but Thumbelina kept silent. When the two others had turned their backs, she gently stroked the bird's feathers. Little swallow, is it you who sang to me this summer? she whispered. But then the field mouse said they must be getting home, as it was growing late. During the night, Thumbelina could not stop thinking of the swallow. She crept out of bed and wove a large blanket out of hay. Then she carried it to the dead bird and spread it over him. Poor thing, she said, and rested her head on the bird's breast, only to hear something inside the bird go thump, thump. It was the bird's heart. He was not really dead, only frozen with cold. Thank you, dear girl, said the weak swallow. I feel so warm that I think I will soon be able to fly. Oh, no said she. It's snowing outside now. Rest, and I will take care of you until you are well again. That whole winter the swallow remained underground while Thumbelina nursed him, though she never dared tell the mole or the field mouse, for they did not like swallows or any other kind of bird. At last it was spring, and the swallow felt well enough to fly. Thumbelina opened a hole in the roof of the tunnel, and the sun shone in. As he prepared for his journey, the swallow invited her to go with him. But Thumbelina knew it would make the field mouse very sad if she left, and so she said no. I will miss you, said the swallow, and away he flew. Thumbelina felt tears spring to her eyes, but dutifully she returned to her chores. Late that summer, the field mouse announced, I have wonderful news, Thumbelina. The mole has asked to marry you. What a lucky day for a humble child like you. I have already hired four spiders to weave the lace for your wedding gown. I cannot marry the mole, said Thumbelina. I do not love him. Nonsense, replied the field mouse. Don't be pig-headed. He is a very handsome mole. The queen herself does not wear more beautiful velvets and furs. You ought to be thankful for such good fortune. And though Thumbelina protested, the mouse would hear no more complaints. The poor girl was very unhappy and wanted to run away, but she knew winter was coming and she might freeze in the forest. And so she stood at the door for her last glimpse of the summer flowers. Suddenly, she heard her old friend, the swallow, calling to her from the sky. He landed at her doorstep, and Thumbelina poured out her troubles to him. I am about to make my winter journey to warmer lands, said the swallow. Will you join me this time? Yes, I will, said Thumbelina, and she climbed up onto the bird's back. The swallow rose in the air and flew over the forest and the mountains, then high above the sea, until they reached the warm countries where trees were heavy with fruit and the air fragrant with flower blossoms. Finally they came to a lake where there stood the ruins of an old palace. Vines clustered around its pillars and at the top were many swallows' nests. Here's my home, said the swallow, but for you there are the flowers below. Would you like to choose one as your new home? The swallow flew down and Thumbelina slid from his back onto a large flower. How surprised she was to see, in the middle of that very flower, a tiny little man. He had a crown on his head and delicate wings at his shoulders and was not much larger than Thumbelina herself. Oh, how wonderful he is, whispered Thumbelina to the swallow. At first the little king was frightened by the bird, 
who appeared like a giant to him. But when he saw Thumbelina, he was enchanted. He asked her name and if she would stay and perhaps one day be his wife, the queen of all the flowers. This certainly was a very different sort of husband from the son of the toad or the disagreeable mole. So Thumbelina said yes to the handsome king with the kind face, and she took his hand. Then all the flowers opened, and out of every one came more tiny people. Each of them brought Thumbelina a gift, but the best was a pair of wings, so that she too could fly from flower to flower. Then there was much rejoicing, and the swallow sang to them about Thumbelina and her adventures. When winter came to an end, it was time for the swallow to say farewell and make his yearly journey back to Denmark. There he had a nest over the window of a house in which lived a writer of fairy tales. And every evening, as the sun would set, the swallow sang, Tweet, tweet! And from his song came this very story. The End <laughs>